Hello, hello. Good morning. I hope you're out there. We're here. We're just hiding over in the corner. <laughs> in the dark. Well now. Let's get a couple of you in here. Ah, oh, there we go. We got at least one, so I'm not talking to myself, even though I do that anyway. Okay, good morning, Lynn. Good to have you here. Alrighty, good morning and welcome to the Art of Fire. I'm Bruce. We're going to do another Facebook Live presentation. And if you were with us about, oh, 30 minutes ago, we started doing them on YouTube also. We've been posting our videos onto YouTube anyway. And we thought, well, what the heck, why not just do like a real quick down and dirty demonstration before we start this one. So uh, you join us at 10.30 to see a little bit of live streaming on YouTube. And here we are with the main show. Hello, hello, Liz and Lynn and Susie. Good to see you. Okay, our theme today is colors. And we're going to have a couple of really interesting color co presentations here. We want you to stick around and see. All right, so uh, the order of business today, Foster will be making a long stem goblet, and uh, then Josh will be making a powder vase, and that's because of the decorative pattern on it. We'll explain more about that in a little bit. Uh, Foster will come back and make a flower trumpet-shaped vase, and then uh, Todd will give us a platter with a feather twist, and that's really gonna be kind of exciting because he's got a brand new pattern of putting the colors together. So you'll want to stick around and see that. Uh, we've got our pieces on demonstration here for the display. We don't have any prices posted. If you'd like to order any one of these or perhaps order one in a different color, just contact Theta. You can use the comment section. You can use direct messaging. Uh, you can get on our website. At any rate, you can refer to and number one here, which is a pair of long stem goblets, a celadon color. And number two is a red color with uh, the long stem also. Number three is a sample of the powder vase that Josh is going to be making a little bit later on. Four and five are the uh, trumpet shaped flower vases. Number six right there is a jack in the pulpit. And this is a fan vase next to it which is actually number eight. We'll skip to the back for a large platter, number seven there, with a crisscross kind of fishnet design in it. Nine is a beautiful flower centered in the uh, platter that Todd's made there. And number 10 is uh, pretty much the same type of thing, but the color is more uniform. Like to mention that Mary Beth Morgan was drawn as the winner of our uh, Jack in the Pulpit vase from last week. And for this coming week, our prize is going to be a Celadon long stem goblin. So, uh, there is the long stem that will be given away for next week. And uh, that's pretty much it right there. Also, like to mention that we do have gift certificates available. Why is it called a Jack in the Pulpit? Because that's the flower that it's supposed to look like. And uh, so, here's a gift certificate. We have these. You can order them online. You can uh, stop in the studio if you want to pick one up, but online is probably easier. We can ship it right to you. And that's a really great way to give gifts when you're not exactly sure what somebody else will want. Let's come back to the Jack in the Pulpit that Bridget asked about. If you, well, probably if you Google it or search any way online, you can find a flower that looks very much like that. So uh, without further ado, Foster, what you got for us today? We're going to uh, start the uh, start the start by doing a long stem goblin. What color? It's going to be the Celadon uh, cup with the clear long stem and uh, clear foot. And All right. So it is actually uh, part of a set uh, for somebody who's ordered it. And uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get the color. Let's go. Let's roll. And if you watched the football game last night, it's time to say roll tide. Wait, was the national championship last night? Yes, it was. Oh, shit. I'm, 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 excuse the language, and I'm sorry for the spoiler. 
I should have said spoiler alert. Oh, I'm so sorry, Todd. That's okay. That's, that's as bad as giving away the winner of last uh, year's so Blown Away. I thought it was Wednesday night. I thought the game was Wednesday night, so I totally missed it. Oh, my goodness. But I was enjoying the Ravens victory. I'm okay. Okay. Well, Bruce, you, gotta, you know you got to wait three days before you can spoil it. That's just, the etiquette. It just <laughs> occurred to me. Wow. Okay. Well, at any rate, uh, there you go. So now, 52 to 24, I believe. It was, uh, it was. So, let me know. Oh, Barbara Spitzer from Dortmund, Germany is with us. So, is there anybody else that's watching today that was waiting to watch a replay of that football game because it was on so late and I just spoiled it for you? I'm just curious. I don't take pride in that. But is there anyone else who was waiting to find out the score? Okay, so Foster has put the color up on the top of his glory hole and now on the floor. So it has to be preheated in order to stick to the pipe. So he's got the pipe preheated and we'll get the color up on it. And then into the glory hole to melt it in. And the reason he's pushing that pipe back and forth is he doesn't want the thermal shock to crack it. So the color hadn't quite come up to speed yet. So, there he goes. A quick, easy introduction. Brian Holcomb says, oh shit, you are live. I am. Did you, did, yes, I was are. he expecting something different? <laughs> Last Good morning, Brian. Good Jennifer, morning. sorry about that. Good morning, Bob. <laughs> All right, so Foster's got his celadon on the end of the pipe. He's uh, warming that up, and as soon as he gets that melted in, he's going to uh, go over to the Marver and shape it up a little bit. What's that? <laughs> okay. Good morning, Jeanette. Glad to have you with us. I'm just about there. In the moment. <laughs> In the moment. Good morning, Joanna. Welcome to, from the UK. We've got the UK. We've got Germany. Uh, we should have Netherlands here before long. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yep. Michael's okay. Oh, Brian wasn't questioning you being alive. He was questioning me because I had missed a week, a couple weeks ago, and I guess he hadn't seen me back last week. So, yes, I am alive. It lives. <laughs> okay, so we've got the color heated up and a little bit of bubble blown into it. You can see that kind of rounded shape. We'll come over here and get a close look as he pulls that back, and that's what he's going to gather over here. All right, so it'll be a couple of gathers over this one at a time, and Foster's going back over. We have a uh, pipe cooler over there, uh, a trough of water that will keep the pipe nice and cool. He'll take his gather and head back to the bench. We're all doing well, jo Joanna. Very, very well. Thank you. Oh, now Jennifer's turning the volume down. Uh, I that just caught me by surprise. We'll. We'll try not to have any repeats. Okay, Foster's got the cherry wood block now. He's going to use that to shape and gently cool the outside of the glass. You can see the steam rising from the block. That's because the water that's in the uh, cup is evaporating and is causing steam. It's also burning just a little bit. Foster blows in the compressed air, pushes the color out pretty much throughout the bubble. He's using the block now just to cool it a little bit. And that's going to assist him with the next gather. If he goes in and gathers while the glass is too hot, it'll make it collapse. The interior la layer will collapse and he'll have to start it all over again. Please tell me there'll be something cobalt blue today. Uh, what, color? what color's the... What 
What color is Trumpet. the flower trumpet? Cobalt blue, right? That's uh, mountain blue and jade green. Cobalt. Okay, it's, it's close. close. Enough, cobalt it's, close. <laughs> it's so close you probably can't tell the difference unless he really thins it out. Okay. So he's going to come back now with the next gather of glass. He's stripping some of the glass off into the furnace because he doesn't need all that he gathered. It's much better to gather a little more than you need because if you don't have enough, you got to go back again and it's hard to add glass to it. You can see the cold core of that. It's dark in the middle. He's going to block that again to shape it some. And you can see where the clear gather outlines or overlays the color core. The jacks are being used to create a line for it to separate. And he blows, covers the pipe with his finger, and the glass expands. Okay, so now he's going to take a couple of reheats. He's going to inflate that more, take measurements to see that he's got the cup size just right because this is part of an order. You want the sizes to match. So, he'll have a couple of pair of calipers set to the measurements he wants for the diameter, also the length. It's pretty much spherical, so at this stage he can use one measurement. The finished product is spherical. You can see right now it's a little egg shape. But as soon as he blows again, you'll see it expand. He's using newspaper to cool the bottom so the bottom doesn't get blown excessively thin. And now once again, up we go. By holding the iron horizontal, he gets a nice sphere to form. Were he to hold it down, it would lengthen, become kind of oblong. So now he's got that nice spherical shape. You can see the celadon color starting to appear and one pair of one caliper set for the diameter actually gives him the measurements he needs. He's going to use his uh, paper jacks. They're actually cardboard tubes just to kind of gently shape and set the sides. He's got his chalk to mark the center at the bottom and now I'll hand it off to Josh. Does the glass shrink at all during the cooling? Yes it does. What if he held it up? Good question Susie. It would collapse back toward the pipe. And quite often we do that when we're making bowls. Uh, the easiest definition of a vase or a drinking cup is a glass that's taller than it is wide, and a bowl is something that's wider than it is tall. So when we hang the glass down and it gets long and narrow, the opposite effect takes place when we point it up toward the ceiling and let it fall back toward the pipe. They're getting ready for the long stem right now. Foster's going to cut a jack line in the glass. This aids in its separation from the pipe, and it'll drip right down onto the cup that Josh has in front of him. He'll hit those marks, get the glass centered, and cut it off. Josh will turn the pipe gently just to help keep it centered, and now Foster will use the back of the jacks, the hinge, to press the glass into the body of the cup. He'll taper it a little bit, and now he'll use the jack blades to separate it from the cup just a little bit. See how he created that flat spot and then the ball? And now he gently leans out with the jacks to stretch it. He's going to take that stem out to about half of its final length. But before we go any further, Josh is going to come over with a little bit of glass to help keep things from cracking. That area of the pipe, uh, where the glass is on the pipe is called a moil, so this is called a moil wrap. And by putting that extra glass there, we've ensured that we retain heat throughout. By using the paper to cool the glass near the cup, when Foster comes back and reheats, he'll pull the glass out from the lower part of the stem. So lots of times we will pre-cool the glass before going for a reheat. Foster's working on the stem right now. If the entire stem is equally hot, then it's all going to pull out. And you get, might get a little too thin up at the top of the stem. So now what? So there he goes with the paper again. 
Now watch where it thins out as he pulls. The glass up by the cup stays pretty much the same diameter. The decrease in diameter is toward that ball on the end. He'll take a measurement to check the length of the stem and use his paper pegs again to stabilize and gently cool without stealing a lot of heat. Joanna, we think that's a lovely color too. And we'd like it if you all would like or share, comment. Remember, comments are how you get entered in next week's drawing. And next week's drawing is for a long stem goblet, just the same color as this one you're watching be made right now. So be sure to get your name in there on the comments. That's how you'll get entered. If you share, we really appreciate it because that helps increase our viewership. The more people that know about us, the more folks will watch us. And we like it if you like us just because everybody likes to be liked. Again, our winner for the Jack in the Pulpit last week was Mary Beth Morgan. And uh, Mary Beth, are you with us? I haven't seen a name go flying across the screen yet. Okay, so Foster's back with another gather of glass. Again, with the separation with the jack blades. That little cut right there helps it flow off the pipe just a little bit easier. Hello, Rude. Good morning. Glad to have you with us. Here we go with the foot in place. And now Foster will get to work with the footboard. He's going to use the wooden boards to pat that and keep it centered. Then he'll pinch the glass between the two boards. The large board on the back side is what it flattens against. The smaller board on the front side has notches cut in it. And those notches are what allows this wood to surround the stem. He's got it cut down now. Foster Lois Scanlon says she hopes you get up to the Thousand Islands again soon. There we go. Oh, and a couple of you have liked, shared, and commented. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Now Foster's going to use his uh, carbide paddle and he's going to shape this. He's going to flatten the end and now he's going to turn it over and you can see the profile of that carbon right there. It's uh, rounded and tapered so that he gives that same taper to the slope of the foot. And that's what makes that really beautiful profile. He'll hand that off to Josh and it's time for the transfer. So now Foster will take a single gather of glass, relatively small, and then he'll bring it back over and shape it up, and then we'll do the transfer. So you see he holds the pipe up. I think it was Susie asked earlier what happens if he holds it up. The glass all fell back toward the pipe. And that's our objective in this case. Now we're going to watch Foster. He's going to take his file, and he's going to attach that to the foot. And we'll get a real good look at what's going on right there by hitting the center and then moving it around. He uses the file to press down gently on it. Then he'll score the neck. This helps in the break off and a little tap and off it comes. Now that glass was cold enough to fracture, which means it's going to take a little while to reheat. Also, you'll notice that the glass is actually still moving around a little bit. We do that uh, putty break off when the glass is still a little bit warm. So it'll be dancing around just a little bit. But by keeping his eye on it and keeping it centered, Foster will get the top of the piece heated up, an occasional flash to keep it from cracking. And then when he's ready, he'll go back to the bench to open it up. Again, that glass was cold enough to fracture. It takes a few more seconds to get it heated up enough to actually manipulate. Don't forget we have gift certificates available if you'd like to order any of the pieces you see here or in our catalog. And we take custom orders. We even do repair work. So if you've got a piece of glass that's been in the family for a while and gotten broken, we might be able to take care of that for you too. Check our online catalog for a heck of a lot more pieces than what you see on display here today. So Foster's now just about got the lip of that hot, and he does in fact. You can see where the heat is by the color change. The 
brighter color out at the edge of it is where the heat's concentrated and that's the glass that will move. You'll use a steam cone now, another wooden tool held in water. See the expansion, the diameter increasing? That's because the water is evaporating in the form of steam and the steam is pushing the hot glass out. You'll also notice that it only moves the hot glass. Does the brightness of the glory hole affect your vision like a flash bulb does? Um, no, not really. And we kind of learn not to stare right into it. I mean, we're looking in there, but you don't just stare right at the bright part of the flame. No, you're looking at the glass. Itself. You look at the glass. There is, uh, it's kind of like peripheral vision. You do get brightness there but uh, it's not like it burns your eyes out or anything like that. Does a higher or lower temperature have effect on the a final color? Uh, really, no. Um, there are colors that react to heat. There are a few specific colors, but in the case of this Celadon, no. It is what it is. So it's gonna change colors through the heat range as the metal oxides in there react differently. But by the time he gets the piece done, it's going to be the same color no matter what the temperature was along its working. Now if we take a color like, uh, a lot of folks really like the copper ruby color. And the copper ruby color strikes. And what happens is there's a reaction that takes place in, within the glass due to heat. And the way we get it to strike quite often is to heat it up a great deal and then let it cool, and then reheat it again. And this heating and cooling is the striking action. So, another flash in there. And it's done. Now it's time to take it off. The use of a butter knife around the uh, punty. Not to knock it off, but to chill it so that when he taps the pipe with a hammer handle, or, uh, yeah, he'll hit that with a ha uh, hammer handle, the vibration breaks it free, and he'll grab his insulated glove and put it away. And Rude uses special glasses for looking in the fire. Yeah, you can, uh, a lot of people do wear glasses, sometimes with uh, welder shades rating, or uh, some people even use ones that are similar to what flame workers used uh, and that's very helpful. So there we go with the Celadon goblet and whoever it was that asked about the color and the heat, it should turn out looking just like that. And here's two others right here. So the, the color is, is going to be the color pretty much. Okay, there's a long stem goblet. Now the next piece is going to be a powder base. And in fact, it's going to be the same colors right here. We've got a red color, we've got blue in it, and we've got white. And so Josh is going to be doing this piece. You thought Foster should be tough enough to grab it with his bare hands. No, Bridget, I'm afraid not. None of, none of us are that tough and none of us are that stupid. Okay, so, uh, Josh, any words about your uh, powder vase? No. Okay. It's, just, uh, it's kind of an interesting process how this comes about. It's actually three different layers of powders. Blue, and believe it or not, it's actually white, and then red over top of it. And since blue is such a soft color, and red's actually a really stiff color, the blue tries to make its way to the surface the more you heat it. When it makes its way to the surface, it gives you this really interesting kind of crackled or some people call it a glaze pattern. And that's what we're going to be working with. So just playing with the different viscosities of the, the powders. Cool. Great. Uh, no, Bridget, when a piece, piece falls off the pipe, we're not tempted to grab it. Uh, we've, we've had some students that uh, that would be their first reaction, but we always stop them. We're always close enough. So there we have the powdered vase, which we're going to see next. And uh, you just saw the Celadon long stem goblet. And uh, you want to ask Theta if Mary Beth showed up in the comments yet? I haven't seen her name yet. No. 
No, she didn't. No, not yet. Okay, that's fine. She was the winner for last week's prize, the red jack in the pulpit. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with Josh. So we'll come on back here. So his first gathers will be clear, and then he'll go through a progression of powders. And as he explained, he'll start with the blue, and then he'll work through the white and the red. And here are the powders over here. I'll get closer, give him room to walk by to his bench. Here's our blue powder, our white powder, and our red powder. going to block again just to get this in shape, stabilize the glass. You can see it's really moving around a lot. That's one of the reasons for using the block. It just uh, it cools the outside a little bit and gives us a nice stable layer out there. And by continually rotating the pipe, looking for the motion, Josh can decide when it's time to blow into it and trap compressed air. Now, you always hear people say, you know, oh, I can't blow glass, you know, my lungs aren't very great. It really doesn't take much pressure to actually get this inflated. It's actually way less than actually blowing up a balloon. So just a little tiny bit of pressure. Trap that pressure. Here comes the bubble. Yep, so the glass is doing all the work. I barely put any pressure into it. There we go. And he's got that filled three quarters of the way. And as he said, minimal effort as far as the blowing. So anybody can blow glass. Do you agree with me that uh, centering is probably the hardest part of glass blowing for someone that learns? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely centering. Yep. So that's why you see him constantly turning. And every once in a while, he may stop for a moment just to see if there's any motion. And here's a really interesting aspect of it. He's going to turn for a minute. And you don't really see that moving up and down a lot. If this glass was off-center, you would see it bumping up on some of the rotations. So that's what we see when we've got it really well centered. It doesn't seem to move at all. You want to know number four? Yeah. Okay. So, just like Roy Scheider and uh, Jaws, I'm going to need a bigger block. Because he's going to have more glass. Hey Foster, Susie says she almost had a heart attack the first time you saw, she saw you let the pipe roll down the bench and didn't know that there were stops at the end of the bench. So now let's see if we can find with the blocker. I just got See how it's moving up and down a little bit? It's got a high spot. That means it's not centered. So now when Josh applies the block and rolls evenly applying smooth pressure all the way around, so yeah, now, so see you'll there? see, you know, when you're first starting, you'll be rolling like this and you're not sure what to do. So you'll just keep rolling and it gets worse and worse. It gets worse. You bring the high side up and let it fall. Yep, so if I'm off center like this, I bring it up to the highest point. Once I think it's in line, turn again. Oh, there needs a little bit more. And now you can see it's back on center. Yes, David, I did know that the shark from Jaws was named Bruce. I'd huh? like uh, it was, yeah. There was actually a name for the shark? Yeah. Oh. The mechanic okay. the mechanical, oh, the mechanical shark, shark was named Bruce. No kidding. <laughs> I'd like to claim that I'm young enough that my parents named me after it, but no, that's not the case. Okay, so now just a little bit of air pressure and the bubble grows a little bit more. And yes, Cindy, it is possible to overblow the glass. It's very easy to overblow the glass. In fact, one of the major mistakes we see with people we teach when they're first starting a number five. So the number four and number five we're talking about is referring to the size of the block. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, it is possible to overblow or just absolutely blow too much uh, too often. 
and also it has to do with where the heat is in the glass. Glass is very thick down at the tip down there. If Josh were to blow in that right now, it would probably still expand right there, but not so much up near the pipe where the glass is thinner. And that would leave a problem for him. That would get the bottom too thin, and that's not a result we want. Maybe the shark was named after me. I'll go with that. Okay, so Josh has taken his final gather now. So you can see that this is going to be a pretty good sized piece by pointing the pipe downward in the furnace. Some of it strips off. That's a lot of glass, but look, he's still got that centered and under control by turning slowly and just moving gently around the studio. He's cooled the pipe off and now he can grab it further up toward the glass. Notice how far forward his hand is. After he took his gather, he probably couldn't have touched it right there. So by having that leverage, getting that fulcrum moved forward, he's able to grab on a higher spot on the pipe and get it in there and really control it as he turns. So this is the base coat, this is the blue, and Josh referred to it as a soft color. It heats up quickly and it wants to move around. So now he's back into the blue again, and this blue face is what's going to push out through the other color. Foster's got a gloved tan. Notice how close his thumb is to that glass, and I can guarantee you it's still hot even with the glove on. Okay, so now we got the blue. White next. Uh, one more blue. One more blue. Three blue, two white, one red. Okay, there's a formula to it. What are the color bowls made of? Uh, look like aluminum, but what are the bowls? Stainless, stainless steel. Stainless? Stainless, stainless. okay, stainless steel. Yes, uh, Barbara, the powders are powdered glass. Uh, when we buy our glass, we can either buy it in solid form, which comes in rod, or we can buy it in granular glass, which is called frit, of various grinds, uh, some very fine, some pretty thick. And we can take that all the way down to requesting powder, which is like the ultimate. And that really is about the consistency of uh, flour. Uh, it's not actually a fine frit. We do get fine frits that are almost the same size, but this you really can't differentiate so much between the pieces, whereas the frit you could. But you can think of it that way as a super fine frit. I think it actually goes through another process or two beyond the grinding that you get with the uh, frit. But we'll check that out. All right, so there's his second gather of white. And you can't even, well, you can see a shadow of the blue, but barely at all. So with the two whites done right now, he'll be back and pick up the one gather of red, and then we'll watch the magic. So he's got a lot of heat in that, and now he's going to come in and get a good coating of red, covering the whole thing. And then it's going to be the heating process that he described that the blue forces its way out. By getting it really, really hot, that's what's going to happen. And that's what it makes it appear as dots on the surface. So what he's doing right now, he's letting this stabilize. You can see it just looks like it's solid red. So, and that was just with a little bit of heat. 
So I'll give it a little bit more heat, and you'll start to see it, and I'll heat it some more, just so you can see the process. So the blue base layer is trying to push its way out. We've come full circle from the uh, phoenix that was pushing its way out of the egg on our first broadcast. <laughs> It's going to take a couple of reheats to get this to happen. Let's see if we start to see anything yet. Just barely, if you look down at the bottom where it's the hottest, you start to you see those rings. See the white pushing through right now? The blue's pushing it out. You know, the end's always the hottest. You know, that's the first thing in the Corio, last thing out. It doesn't have the metal stealing heat, so the end's always going to heat up first, and then it works its way to the pipe. Uh, no, Rude, we only have one burner inside the glory hole. We don't have uh, we don't have two burners at work here. But it's got a lot of BTUs. Now you can see the speckles appearing toward the bottom more where the intense heat is, and you can probably tell, even with this camera, that it's hotter at the tip, as Josh said, and you're starting to see the color pattern appear. So the more I do it, the more I keep heating and getting it hot, I can control how much pattern's on the surface. Sometimes I just want a little bit of pattern, sometimes I want a lot. What do you want today? Not sure. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it until I kind of have a really nice, kind of even spread of the pattern. That's pretty darn hot. Okay, Let's now, like look how far up, up the heat is right now. It's come up a lot further. We're up about to the midpoint where the glass is the widest. And you're starting to see more of that speckly appearance. In a few moments, you're going to see more of the color in it because it won't be just all the heat that you're seeing. But as the powders push aside and out, you can see it happening. Now you can see the blue and white rings down there, but you're not seeing so many up at the top. And just as Josh said, that's because of the application of the heat. Well, hello, Michael Herman. Welcome aboard. Hey! <laughs> Okay. So here we come now with another heat application. You can see that brighter yellow color is now up at least about three quarters of the way from the bottom toward the pipe. That looks pretty good. Yeah. And as it cools now, the block is cooling the outer surface of the glass. You're going to see the color a lot more pronounced. You'll be able to see those bubbles coming through. And as it stabilizes, there we go. Just going to apply a little bit of air. And now you can really see the pattern. And he's even accommodating us by slowing his roll. All right. <laughs> yeah, David, the pipe does get hot. And he really had to have it quite a ways in there to get it uh, warm all the way up. He's using the barber now to cool the bottom of the piece. If you watch the long stem goblet that Foster made earlier, you saw him use the newspaper to cool a portion of the glass before reheating. Josh just used a bigger cooling device. He used the Marver. And by pre-cooling the bottom of that, everything gets hot when he goes in the glory hole. So if the bottom was 400 degrees cooler than the top when he went in, it's still going to be a lot cooler than the top when it comes out. The inflation is going to take up near the top of the piece. See that? It's blowing out right up near the blowpipe. The bottom didn't expand much at all. And this white's also a striking white. 
So you really won't see that yellowish white until it starts to cool. Now you're really getting to see a lot of the dots in that. Outstanding. So it really is a beautiful pattern and uh, really kind of an unusual one. Well, thank you, Michelle. We're always glad to show different techniques. And if any of you are new to this, uh, our broadcast, we're glad to have you. We're here every week, and we just recently started adding a YouTube. In fact, today we started that. And uh, so we're doing like a little appetizer before the main meal. If you check out our YouTube channel, we do a live stream presentation there. Today, Foster made a piece. Right now, we're using the, bot the uh, paper to cool the bottom. What do you want to do? What's shape wise? Okay, so they've got the doors in. Josh has got this glass in there almost to the depth of the jack line he made. There's no point heating the jack line a lot because he doesn't want that moving. But now what he's going to do, you can see the heat's in the bottom of the piece by the orangish glow in the bottom. And that's what allowed him to get that nice taper, okay? He could have done that with a lot of tools, but he managed to do it with centrifugal force by spinning it, using a little bit of gravity. He's elongated it and got a beautiful taper down the side. See where the heat is, the concentration of the orange color indicates where the glass will be making its move. And there it's stretched out. It doesn't come out completely symmetrical because of the, the stretching and the heat and the swinging, but all he has to do is when he gets that to the point he wants, just a little bit of air will inflate it. Looks like right now he's heating with a little bit less depth, and he's gonna swing it out some more. Notice he starts gently. Then, as it cools a little bit, he can get a little more aggressive. And he'll probably come back to the bench, yep, for his blow hose. As this piece rotates, I'll get at the end, you can see it's not quite round, okay? But we expect that from the swinging. With the blow hose now and another application of heat, he'll be able to take his newspaper, then guide the glass back into shape as he blows. So the newspaper is going to act kind of like a mini marver. Not so much to uh, cool it or anything, but to just gently keep a symmetrical shape as he blows. So let's watch him take the little flat spot out of it. You can see from the end right, that it's not quite brown, but by blowing and using the paper as a straight edge and coming down the length of the glass, you can see that wobble disappearing. And he'll do that until he's satisfied that he's got it. What happens when the piece is larger than the size of the glory hole doors? Well, you either hit the doors or you stop. In the case of our platters, when we spin them out, we can't go back in for another reheat. Once you spin the piece out and if you've exceeded the diameter of the glory hole, you're done. Okay, so he's getting more heat throughout. He's still got his blow hose. That should tell us that he's going to do a little more shaping. He's cooling and flattening the end. And there's an area right down through here that he's got his eye on it just to make sure it's nice and straight. The newspaper is really a great tool for us because it allows us, just like a potter would, to be able to shape the glass with our hand, which is, would obviously be a mistake without the newspaper or some other insulating material. So I just put some water on the newspaper so that when he comes back this next time, actually he'll grab the jacks. This is what we call the cheater, or a bit that goes on the bottom. 
and place it in the middle and it just trails right off and burns itself off. This ensures that after we attach the punty that it doesn't take any of the powder that's on the bottom of the piece with it and it also provides a little more stability. Hey, Foster, you can paddle? Please. So now, Josh is going to go back and take a reheat. You heard him ask Foster about paddling. They're going to team up on this because Josh needs to keep the lower profile as is while the bottom gets flattened. Were he to just press straight in with the paddle, he would distort the glass that's immediately above the bottom of the vessel. So by the two of them working on this together, he'll keep the nice straight line and Foster will paddle it flat. So should one of you want this piece and order it, it will sit up perfectly straight on your table or mantle or wherever you choose to display it. So you see the heat's in the bottom. That's where we want it to move. Josh has got the newspaper in hand. He holds the glass base in position. Foster presses hard. And while Foster's pressing hard, Josh's thumb and fingers are keeping the glass pressed in. And there we go. Beautiful job. So we're going to go again? Yeah, we're going to do just a little bit more. So when he comes back again, you'll see, no problem, Virginia, you're welcome to join us anytime. So when he comes back, you'll see that the orange glow of the heat is concentrated, oh, in about the bottom four or five inches of the piece. Foster will be flattening on Josh's command, and Josh will be holding the sides in so that it doesn't get squished. He's applying pressure with his fingers to the newspaper, getting a nice, beautiful taper. See the little scallop there, the little indentation that's caused by his thumb pushing into the glass. If this was a uh, potter on a potter's wheel, they'd do it the same way, but they wouldn't use wet newspaper. So now we've got a beautiful profile on the bottom of this face. We've got the flattened bottom, and you can see how the cheater disc wound up right in there. Won't be visible in the finished product unless you lay it on its edge. So it's time for the transfer. So Foster is going to shape up the punty on the, on the marver over there. Josh is just going to get an easy heat into this. He doesn't want it super hot because he doesn't want it moving around. And then after Foster comes over, he'll place it. He's making sure that everything stays straight and symmetrical there with the paper. See his thumb pressing in? That's what gives us that profile. One last little touch with the paddle. And you can see that there's almost no glow in the bottom, so there's no danger of misshaping the piece. Josh will place it in the center. And then as he turns the pipe, the tweezer blade on top of the pipe helps him push it into center. Very important to keep it centered because in order to be able to open it symmetrical, it needs to all be in one straight line. And centering in this case just means basically in line with the central axis of the piece. So if we start back here at Foster's hands and we go down towards Josh's hands, we see one straight line. A couple of drops of water, a tap, and Foster takes it over to the glory hole to begin the reheating process. Now, it's a lot bigger than that goblet was, but some of the same principles applies. Have you ever made a ginger jar with a lid? Yeah. That's a, actually, this is going to have a lid as well. So that uh, lip was uh, cold enough to fracture. It's going to take a little while to reheat. And what Josh will do is during this reheating process, he'll simply flash the piece by putting all of it into the heat. Once he gets the lip of that hot, he'll bring that out for a little bit of manipulation. Thank you, Amy. I knew somebody was going to ask how heavy is it. Five? Yeah, five, five pounds. Sometimes when he goes in for a flash, we'll try to sight down the iron. The iron actually curves. 
there's enough weight on the outside of that that it actually bends the iron down a little bit. But because he's turning constantly, you can't quite see it. Notice how long he's been here on this reheat. At every other stage throughout, we haven't had to stay this long. But at all the other stages, he was dealing either with freshly gathered glass or glass that wasn't long removed from the gather. Now he's got cold glass at the bottom. Well, cold relatively speaking. Look at all those beautiful circles in the bottom half. He's changing the line, just setting the line on it just to make sure that's right. And now he'll go back for another heat and start working the lip. So if he notices something off when he comes back to the bench, he fixes it. And that's what he did with the body side that time. There was a part of the line he just didn't like quite as much. By taking the newspaper and pressing against it as he turned, he got a nice symmetrical shape going. And now it won't take near as long to heat the lip because he'd already taken care of that with his first reheat. Notice him leaning forward and peering into the glory hole. He's kind of looking over the piece to see what's going on. You can actually see, just about see the tip of the piece. You can't see in the hole at the end, but you can see the lip if you get up there and look over. So now we've got a lot of heat up in the top of this vessel. And with his jacks into the mouth and Foster comes on with the paddle just to keep things nice and flat. And now shaping the shoulders again. couple of sprinkles of water on here for him and uh, so you heard him ask for the Sofietta and he asked for the big one. Now, this has a larger cone than the others we normally use and this is going to help him blow so that out. So. For me, you Okay, so we got the Sofietta done, cleaned up. Foster's going to do it. Josh is going to hold the side. How did you guys grab the Sofietta Foster? So when Josh refers to holding the shoulders, he's going to use the newspaper here. We'll put a little drip of water on there for him. There we go. So he's going to hold the shoulders in to keep them from blowing out. Foster will, when, when Josh asks, he'll put the cone into the piece and blow. Notice how Josh brought his thumb up toward the top of the piece for a moment just to keep that nice rounded edge. And Foster's fingers are wiggly because it's getting hot right there. Okay, now we got a beautiful profile coming up with a nice shoulder rolling over. How many pieces do we make in the average week? Uh, actually, that kind of depends on how much we need to get made. Uh, when the Ren Fair is running, and a lot of you have been out there to purchase a lot of the pieces, we've been in here on a Saturday and tried to crank out about 50 pumpkins. So, if the need is there, we can make a lot. When it's not, uh, we make what we need. Okay, so he's holding the side in again. And notice he's come up to the top, the shoulder a little more. Foster's blowing into it. Okay. The jacks will pull the lip out a little bit. It got pushed in just a tad. Beautiful. And now you can see those blue and white bubbles appearing throughout. It's a really interesting concept of how that blue pushes its way to the surface and just spreads the white and the red apart.
We appreciate that, Diane. We do think it's pretty also. So, really beautiful piece. And it's a, a kind of a different color application than you usually see. Okay, so he's going to have Foster paddle while he brings the lip out ever so gently. He wants a shape there that it'll accept the lid that he makes later on. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Beautiful design. Yeah, look at those colors coming through. Absolutely spectacular. So now what it'll take is a couple of flashes here just to equalize the heat throughout. Foster's going to get gloved up over here with insulated gloves and they'll take it off. Okay, Foster's getting a different set of gloves. Josh is just making sure everything like is like he wants. Profile the straight line. Now he'll probably turn this a little bit at the bench when he comes back, but I'll tell you something that's cool to look for. One of the things you can tell is if we got it straight sided is if the fluorescent light reflection in the glass appears to be a straight line instead of like a big old wobble. And if they move all over or they're not straight lines, the glass isn't straight. And look at that. I see four perfect reflections of the fluorescent light in the top of the vase. Josh is going to put a little water between the punty and the cheater bit. Foster will catch the piece. We'll put it away in the annealer. A little tap and off it comes. Josh is going to grab the door. And in it goes. You can see the steam rising from Foster's gloves. They do sometimes get hot. Wow, look at the smoke. Nice job. Wonderful, yeah. Josh. Let's hear it for Josh, Thank folks. You. How about some hearts, some thumbs up, and all that other good stuff? All righty, and Foster, too. Way yeah, to go, so guys. Tomorrow or the next day, I'll probably end up making a really nice black lid for it that has a little handle on the top that'll fit really nicely. And we'll get some pictures of that later. But it'll fit that shape really well. So, okay. Yeah, really happy with that. Awesome. And awesome. There, okay. Let's uh, let's take a little break and wander on back down here. And let's see. We're about halfway through this thing, and I still haven't seen Mary Beth Morgan show up, but she was the winner of the red jack in the pulpit. So uh, if you want to win next week's prize, then get your name in the comments section. Make comments and you're entered. And next week we're going to give a single goblet away, a long stem goblet with a celadon bowl on it. And then uh, maybe Mary Beth will be watching a rebroadcast of this later on. So uh, we'd like to mention Foster. And Mary Beth Morgan actually came over and visited this past weekend, right? She did. Yeah, and you guys did. worked with her, and she had her parents come in for uh, a little visit? Yeah, and her boyfriend. All righty. Yeah. So, uh, is she there? sounds like that went... No, she's not here yet, oh, but I'm okay. figuring she may watch the rebroadcast. Yeah. So we'd like to thank her for that. And uh, tell the rest of you, if you want to arrange to come in sometime when we're working and see things in action... We've got to do it with uh, absolutely total safe spacing and masks involved and uh, all that sort of stuff. But if, you, if you'd really be interested in getting an even closer look at what goes on, give us a shout. We can probably arrange that for you. Can't have a lot of people in here at one time, but we can certainly have several of you at different times. So, there we've seen the long stem goblet and we've seen the powder vase. And the next one we're going to see is Foster making a flower trumpet vase. So this is an example of it here with a uh, jade green bottom and a peach colored top. And the one directly behind it has a jade green bottom 
and a transparent green top. And this is a really interesting application of color. In fact, it's even something that uh, I've been working on myself lately trying to learn to do. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. It's, it's a lot of fun, but uh, Foster's going to give us a demonstration and see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. So uh, the flower trumpet vase is next, and then we'll be moving on from there. Uh, later on, please don't leave. Stick around. Todd's going to be doing a platter again, but he's going to be doing a new color application. Uh, some of the colors you may have seen him use before, but he's going to apply them in a completely different manner. So uh, that's what's upcoming here at the Art of Fire. Show you what our gift certificates are look, look like. If you don't want to buy something for somebody, give them a gift certificate. And they can pick it out themselves, okay? So uh, that's that. And uh, Remember that Valentine's Day is coming next. Yep, that's right. Valentine's Day is on the way. And we do have these lovely hearts up here. And we also have uh, other heart shapes we can make for you. So Josh and Foster are getting ready to do the color application. And I'm just going to come back here and diverge for a moment. Because uh, I made one of these yesterday. And this is kind of what they look like. So getting those colors in there together and the shapes and everything is really pretty tricky. So uh, fortunately, we're going to see somebody with a lot more experience making it. But uh, that one has a cranberry color with a green bottom. So let's see. Foster is going to do jade green with a mountain blue. So Josh has the jade green bit over here on the end of a uh, punty iron. And he's just heating that up so it'll drop down onto the piece. Foster, in the meantime, is going over to pick up the mountain blue it's a little lighter shade than cobalt blue, but if it's, yeah, it's, if like it's thick, if it's uh, dense, you really can't tell much difference. Uh, with that, it's usually a matter of how much uh, color you actually put in it. You can make the mountain blue really light by not putting too much in it. So Foster's over here, so I'm going to be, I know the process and I can describe it to you, but after having made one myself yesterday, I'm really quite curious to see uh, See how the master does it. So now they're here together. Oh, isn't this sweet? <laughs> now, remember guys, it's, it's just like Ghostbusters. Don't cross streams, okay? All righty. No comment. I'm not even going to. That was, <laughs> they, they were plasma. It was plasma. Come on. Get with the program. So anyway, Foster's going to shape his up a little bit. You can see it's still kind of uh, dog-eared a little bit, and he needs to get that shaped. Josh isn't too worried about shaping his because it's just going to be cut off. So we'll take a look at what Foster's got going on over here. He rolls it on the marver at an angle, and that gives it kind of a tapered conical shape. By pressing straight down, he blunts the end. He's going to start a little bit of air into it, and then he'll marver it back to that conical shape. Now he wants to let that cool, so he's not going back into the heat. And we're going to get a good view right here, and I'm going to learn with you. So he's got the jade green attached to the top, cuts it free, and then he'll roll it on the marver. I take a reheat first. He'll roll it on the marver a little bit so that the two pieces push together but remain distinct. Uh, he doesn't want to push the jade green way up over the mountain blue. He wants a little bit of uh, distinction between them. So that's why he's going to bring it over and marver at the angle again. Okay, so this is what's going to give him the basis for pulling. Now he's got a little tool over there that has a very small hook on it. And what he'll do after getting this all hot is reach over into the jade green and pull little pieces of it up into the field of blue. So let's get over here where we can see. And then I can just keep replaying this video and see what I'm doing wrong. 
<laughs> Here we go. So see how he's got the hook up there, and he pulls it back a little, moves over the other side. Now he comes in between, and if he loses heat, he'll go ahead and reheat it, but looks like he's got it to pull all the way up. Okay, so it misshaped the blue a little bit, but by another application of heat to roll on the marver, or even the back of his jacks, he'll have that straightened back out. So now he's got that really delicate pattern of where the jade green kind of waves up into the blue. And that's going to be really important as he finishes this vase out. Back to the marver. And notice how he's using an inclined at a bit of an angle. If he'd held it perfectly level, it wouldn't have got that long conical shape. And we're going to take a quick look at this after he applies the air. We're going to get close enough, I hope, to see little wibble uh, waves of green. There we go. Yep, now you can see them. So that uh, kind of wavy pattern in the green is right there. That's going to continue throughout the piece. Remember to share. We appreciate it when you share these videos. It gives us a lot wider coverage. I'm not going to say you have more friends than we do, but uh, everybody that you know that we don't and gets a chance to watch this might stick around and watch some more. And uh, if you have a chance, you can drop on by with uh, prior coordination. And let's see here. Oh, don't forget the gift certificates. We also do custom orders. If you see something you'd like, but maybe it's not quite the color you want, just place an order. We got tons of color back there. Uh, we can make pieces that aren't even in our catalog, though it is quite extensive. The color is now surrounded by a gather of clear. You can see the difference in the color. The clear is bright yellow surrounding that color core. Foster's going to block it, keeping it centered. See the steam rising from the block. That's where the water's been evaporating. It makes like a bed of steam, almost like a lubricant for the glass to roll on. Another little blast of compressed air. And watch the orange core grow as it pushes out toward the tip. That's the bubble inside the colors expanding. I'm sure you have more than two friends, David. Okay. No, he said he had shared it with his friends, both of them. <laughs> hey, he's in the spirit of things. There you go. All right, so Foster's letting this cool. You can see the color darken. This is so that his next gather doesn't have the heat penetrate the initial core and cause him problems. So, off he goes to the furnace with a detour to the pipe cooler. Now I expect he's going to strip some glass off. So when his hands go up high and the pipe is pointed straight down into the furnace, the glass drizzles off in there and then one of us has more glass to use. Thank you, Foster. Thank you, thank you, Easter Bunny. He needed that amount of glass to make this vase. So now he's back to the bench and he's going to use his block to shape. Interesting on this, he'll actually use the block to kind of stretch the glass out a little bit because he's going to need to go into this optic mold over here. And in order to do that, he's going to get this glass shape to do it. So, are oh, you using the other one? Okay. Ah, more better. Because that's a good bit of glass to get into that other mold. Yesterday? No. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you had that over there. I thought, wow, he's using the small one. So, with a little bit more room in there, he doesn't have to try to get the size of that down so drastically. This will be a lot better to work with.
into the mold, set it in place, and then real pressurized air. We can even see it spread out in there into the fins. And there it is. There's your design pattern. Now, there you go. Now he's going to reheat it, and he'll gradually lengthen this, put a jack line in it, and start stretching it out for the long vase. So he cuts the jack line in for the separation. And another reheat. Now while he's doing that, I'm going to show you what I find to be the tricky part of making these. Is that doggone long 10 inch stem and keeping it straight while the glass is moving all around and wiggling. And we're working our way toward that right now. He's going to have a diameter on this that is larger than the finished product. But that's because he's going to effectively double the length of that glass that you see there right now. So by cutting the jack line in it papering up there so it doesn't expand. He'll give us a little more volume. So typically we blow the piece larger at these stages than we want the final diameter. We can always decrease the diameter by bringing it down. But we can't, uh, once we get it stretched out, it's kind of hard to increase the size. Okay. Yeah, Joshua, we missed the Ren Fair too, and the and the outfits. Yep, Foster's promised to wear his, his leather mini skirt in here again, but we haven't seen it. Todd is groaning in the background. <laughs> Josh has no reaction. <laughs> Josh is smart. Josh is smart. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Foster's driving the heat into that. And what he's going to do now is just start swinging it a little gently at first and then more and more. He's got his eye on it. So when he used the newspaper to cool the top area of it, that's what allowed him to maintain that bulbous shape right up at the top. So what are you, about two-thirds of the way there, Foster? Uh, on your length? Yeah, three-quarters. Okay. So he's got just, are the shirts for sale? Yes, Joshua, the shirts are for sale. We'll show them in a minute and talk about them. Uh, got to put them on. Okay, we've all got them on. Foster's got a red one, so do I. All right, so there's his calipers set to what, 10? 10 and a half. 10 and a half, okay. So you can see that he's got that straight. And also, look at the green in it. You can see where the green overlays the mountain blue and comes on up. Aha! The old paper pegs over the back of the bench trick. Okay. Somebody mentioned earlier uh, having a, a panic attack the first time they saw Foster leave the pipe on the bench and it rolled toward the end and they thought it was going to come off the end. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty entertaining, but I got a better one. One of the reasons Foster has these tapered benches is when he worked alone and he had to go gather glass for a punty, he would flick the pipe while it was down at this front end, it would roll up the bench, and then it would roll back down the bench by the time it got here. And it's a really pretty cool technique. However, all the benches in here are not constructed the same. The bench that uh, Todd works at has a slightly shorter rail, as does Josh's at the other end. And you can take your hand and flick the pipe, and as it travels toward the back of the bench, it will actually fall off the back of the bench with your piece attached. And having done that, I don't try that anymore. All right, here we go with the foot. Foster has a good bit more glass on what we call a handle iron. Josh goes vertical with the vase. Yes, Cindy, it is. And if I can get a shot through the window over there with the sunshine, you can really get a 
beautiful view of that blue. Foster's going to snip the glass off up there. Josh keeps it turning in center to present it. Wow, look how straight that is. Okay, a couple pats with the footboard and then squeezing it with the footboard. You can see the diameter of the foot increase right before your eyes. That backboard, the wide one, is what keeps it flat. And then after he gets that thinned out and up in shape, he'll be over for a reheat. And then it's back with the carbon paddle again. The carbon paddle's tapered, one side of it's flat. He'll use the flat side to flatten the bottom. Then he'll take the tapered side to help create the gentle slope of the top of the foot. So let's watch that. Now he'll turn that over and use that tapered edge to press against the glass. After he gets the taper he wants, he keeps his eye on the glass and flattens the bottom. All right. He'll hand that off to Josh for the transfer. Yeah, we do think we think the green and the blue is really great. It's a, it's a beautiful color pattern. So Josh will take a couple of reheats with this. Foster will come back. See how he's holding the pipe up? That's what lets the glass drain back down onto the pipe. When we make a putty, we don't want a whole lot of glass sticking off the end. It needs to hold the piece. And if that was about two inches long, it'd just be wiggling all over the place when it got hot. Foster will place it into the middle. Then as he moves the pipe along, turning everything, he can center it, score the neck, and a little tap, and the vibration, it breaks free. Now once again, that end was cold enough to fracture. He'll clean that up a little bit, but he's got to reheat it first, okay? So it's going to take a little while for that to reheat. Notice how the vase is still moving. That's because the connection between the putty and the foot is hot. And as it solidifies, it doesn't go up and down as much. He can get it a little bit closer. And when it starts to cool a little bit, just like that, he'll actually flash it for a few seconds for heat. When he comes out of this, most of the bottom of the piece will appear green or blue, but the top, the very end of it, is going to be bright orange from the heat, and that's where he'll do his work. And for whomever it was that asked about the shirts, here we go. So we've got the Art of Fire glass blowing. We've got a beautiful design by Todd's daughter Violet with the happy cats. Here's one of the emblems uh, on the front of the shirt, and uh, that's it. Okay, so you can see it broke off just a little uneven, but he's got a pair of shears, and he's just going to cut right through the glass. That's going to drop off, and then he'll shape it a little bit and come back for another reheat. Melissa, she says she holds her breath every time I see them transfer. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. We don't want to hold our breath because it makes us tense. And I found that I used to do that. And I found out that if you just breathe through it, you don't screw it up as much. <laughs> or as our friend Michael Herman says, it's just stupid glass. You still out there, Michael? Michael was here several years ago. We've all worked together. Now, see the color there in the end, the bright orange? That's where Foster's concentrated the heat, and that's where he's going to apply the work, okay? His steam cone will inflate that little bulb that's down at the end. You can see that swell out. And now you can imagine how that's going to open up into the trumpet shape. He'll move it just a little bit and then apply more heat. So there is the beginning of it. There's your embryonic trumpet opening, okay? And it's going to wind up just like that. So you can imagine the action that comes with it, right? So he's going to open this up in a moment, and then he'll actually use uh, what we call a fluting plate to put ridges in the end.
righty, here we go. So he's got the heat. There's the initial shape. Now by using the jacks and changing their angle, taking his hand toward the floor, when he comes up behind it like that, he straightens the back side of it. When he's inside, he just opens it up more. Beautiful color combination. I agree with you, Cindy. It's hard to get over something that beautiful. Okay. Okay, we're going to use the fluter. Okay. So we have this plate here that has these uh, brackets on them. And when Foster gets that hot, he's going to bring it out and press the lip of the vessel down into those ridges. So it's almost flat there. Now he brings it over and he presses down and he leans it back and forth a little bit and he'll get those beautiful ridges in the end of the trumpet shape. That flattens it a little bit. It pushes the whole thing back toward the body of the base a little bit. So after he heats it, he's going to come over here to the bench and he's going to put his jacks behind the trumpet lip, I think. And now he's going to lean out with his jacks, and that's going to push the lip over a little bit. One final little adjustment. And look at the beautiful colors in that. Look how the green just kind of flows up into the mountain blue. Beautiful. It's yours if you want to buy it, okay? There's anything here is for sale, <laughs> or most anything. But that's a beautiful vase. That is absolutely gorgeous. It's got your name on it. All right. Foster's going to tap the joint again with the butter knife. This doesn't knock it off. It just chills it so it will break right there. Josh will take the butter knife and hold the pipe up higher. Foster takes the hammer handle and hits it, and it comes right free. Beautiful. There we go. And back to the kneeler it goes. Let's hear it for Foster. Come on. Yeah. That's absolutely gorgeous. Very nice. Very nice. So, uh, as far as how much, Theta can answer you on that. Uh, we don't have any prices on the pieces over here, and I don't recall how much the trumpets are. But we, we've got them, and we can make more of them. Thank you, Foster. There Absolutely you beautiful. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. That was great. Now the only problem I have in replaying that video to polish my technique is uh, I have to silence it, because I don't want to listen to myself. <laughs> <laughs> once okay, once so you. we've worked our way through the program here. And we've done the long stem goblet, the powder vase, and now the flower trumpet vase. And the next one I've been telling you about is Todd's new color treatment for a platter with a feathered twist on it. So we're going to do something a little bit different than we normally see in his color application. A quick review of the pieces up here. We've got uh, long stem uh, celadon goblets here. Actually, we're giving away one of them as our giveaway this week, so make sure to comment. We've got this red pair here. We make them in many, many colors. Uh, number three fell over here, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, it's the powder vase like you just saw Josh make, except the one he made today is going to have a lid on it. Four and five, we've got the uh, flower trumpet vases. Six is a jack in the pulpit. Uh, seven is one of the platters at the back, and eight, another platter with a flower pattern in the middle. Here's another with the flower pattern in the middle, but a uh, more uniform color, and uh, that's actually ten, my apologies. Eight is this fan base over here. So uh, the jack-in-the-pulpit flower, somebody was asking about that earlier. It's uh, typically referred to a piece that has the top, the uh, lip in an area like this. You can see the same type of thing in this one. It just has a wider body, doesn't have that bulbous bottom, okay? So, Theta just posted the price for the trumpets, so there you go. And that one foster just finished is absolutely beautiful. 
So Todd has already started his first gather and uh, he gave me a little bit of explanation. We're going to have a white background or a white yes. note or okay yes. on the outside. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to do something that uh, we're going to be combining a couple of uh, techniques in the piece that I haven't done before and I wanted to see what this would look like and uh, stench with the or follows along with uh, color day we're doing today. And what I've got are four different mixes of colors using uh, varieties of frit, which is the bits and pieces of, of colored glass. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna apply these to this parazon in a few moments, and then I'm going to uh, twist them around. So we'll have these fine bands and threads of these. Uh, colors. Then I'm going to use the uh, hooking tool, which I think we did a while back, but if you didn't see that, that's all right. You'll see it again today quite a bit. Once I get everything hooked, we're going to twist that one more time. Then we're going to put a layer of clear glass over all of that, pick up a layer of the white powder on the most outer gather on the most exterior surface, and that will be the uh, sort of the canvas. So we're going to doing it in reverse. Instead of bleaching a canvas and then painting over it, we are applying color and then putting the canvas on the back of it. Great. Like I said, I haven't done this pattern before with these colors and this style. I've done different steps and different pieces, but we're combining them all today, so let's see what happens. Sounds I exciting. Have we have faith. So we'll give you a little bit closer look at the colors. We've got a goldish color here where we have some peach and cranberry colors mixed. We have a green tint. We've got a blue combination, several different colors in there, and also purple. What Todd will do when he's talking about gathering on a parazon, he'll be gathering these stripes on the sides of the glass he's gathered. So there'll be one stripe, then another, then another, then another. Then when he twists those stripes, he'll get some intermingling of the glass, and then when he goes and does the raking and everything, you see the beautiful design develop. So getting the four colors in here to uh, mix together is what's a little bit different about this and in the manner in which they are laid on the pipe. And when he refers to the white as the canvas, the background, well, this is a platter. So you can well imagine that when we open it up and he spins it out, the white will be on the back side of the bowl or the platter. So it'll look just like those ones that are over on the display counter we showed you earlier. You'll see the colors really vibrant on the inside of the platter, and then it'll be even more striking because there'll be white behind it. So, we're, Melissa, we're really excited, too, to see how this is uh, going to appear because, this, like you said, this hasn't been done. He's boldly going where no man has gone before. So let's take a look over here especially on, I believe this flower one has the white background. So there's the canvas he's talking about. And the thing about that is with all these transparent colors, it actually makes them a little more vibrant to have that white background. The light actually passes through the transparent colors, hits the white, and is kind of reflected back at you. So it gives you a much more vibrant look with the colors. All right, so Todd's getting his measurements ready, and I'm going to find a place that uh, we can film this without a lot of sunshine in the view. We'll come over here. Todd, is this going to get a lip wrap? No. No lip wrap, okay. No lip wrap, yeah. How do you keep track of your experiment slant products? Do you write it down? Yeah, if we, if we make it and we like it, we write it down. If we make it and we don't like it, it never sees the light of day. No, I'm sell kidding. Sell it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lots of times some of this stuff is even written down before it's made because it's just an idea. 
and uh, you want to try and figure out, you know, oh, I think I can do this. As I told you a few weeks ago, Josh is constantly asking me what makes you think that can work. But it does sometimes. All right, so here we go along the length of the piece with the color pickup. Shaping it a little bit to narrow the diameter. And he'll get the gold he wants on there. Doing that color again? Yeah, uh, I got a lot. I'll do one more. Yeah, Joshua, you put white on the inside of lampshades, it's, uh, it's the same principle. Because uh, you on a lampshade, you obviously want the outer surface to be your beautiful decorative interest, and it'd be a shame to hide your color on the inside. Since we're opening this piece up, the uh, inside is actually what will be displayed. So all he's doing right now is changing the shape a little so he can get back into this layer of pink and gold. And he's done with that. So now a little more shaping, and it'll be on to another color. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, so you got the red color? Foster's. Yeah. I'm asking because I get it wrong a lot. It's the jar with the 33 and 35, right? <laughs> <laughs> Josh is messing with him. We, the colors colors have numbers. In fact, I'm going to take the jar from Foster. And here Todd goes with the color on the other side. He's going to tighten that line up a little bit. And he's going to wind up doing it again. So this is what they were talking about, the numbers. So when we make a color combination, and this is, this is really Todd's forte. He's really good with finding colors that work together. What? Roll the beautiful bean footage, man. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, the 218, the 6, and the 232 refer to the manufacturer's numbers of a, uh, a gold color, a peach color, and a cranberry color. And together, those give you a beautiful gold. So now he's doing the green. And Josh was just messing with him a few minutes ago when he says, oh, that's the one with the 33 and the 35, because Foster would have been mixing the gold in with the green. But Foster knows better. You're surprised to touch the table sprinkle so soon after that hot glass. Um, it's not a huge heat transfer. We're not pressing hard into it, and we're not staying on the surface a long time. Yeah. It's warm. It's warm. It's warm, but not hot. Uh, unlike the uh, the piece that Josh made a few moments ago, and he rolled that huge piece of glass back and forth all over the Marver, I can guarantee you, you wouldn't want it to put your hands down on that. So, we got another color, color combination picked up. So, Todd right now is going to create the other stripe. Here we go. This is his blue combinations here. And the purple goes on the opposite side. Now you just got to keep track of which is which, right? That's the yeah. hard part. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> We're all laughing because once you heat it up, they all look kind of orange. They do, don't they? Put some chalk on there. So anyway, uh, actually while that fritz spread apart, you can kind of see that there is a combination of colors, both in the blue and the purple. There's a variety of colors in there that gives him something just a little bit different. So now he's going to get more picked up and another application of the purple combination. Okay. So now he's got these four long lines of color going. When all the color is picked up, and he gets this thing shaped exactly like he wants, that's when he's going to begin the first twist that he was talking about. So what will happen is these bands of color will form a twisted pattern from the top to the bottom of the gather. 
Then after that, he's going to go ahead and let them intermingle more and rake it. But for right now, he's getting a little bit of air in this. And notice how he's pausing in the turn. That's to take those corners off the edge. So he needs to get this back to a cylindrical shape. And the more he goes with this, the more it'll look like a full rotation. You can see it's a little bit rectangular right now. But with a little bit of air, more heat and some turning, it'll be a perfect cylinder. He's got the cylinder in the top three or four inches near the pipe. And now he's just working that down. Once he gets the cylinder done and hot, he'll twist it. Oh, but uh, is this supposed to be like uh, Jack Nicholas on the 18th green? I'm supposed to... Ladies and gentlemen, he's approaching the bar. No, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm muting myself. <laughs> hey, if we can't have some fun, why do it? Yeah, he is carefully looking at it. You, you can't take your eyes off of it, okay? Now, that's another thing we quite often find with students is they want to look around or, uh, I don't know, hey, there's a squirrel. Uh, <laughs> I have a cat. Now he's twisting. Okay, I'll get back to the subject at hand. By putting the iron down like that and twisting, you can start to see the color lines twist. And they don't actually mix into each other so much as they form a pattern going down the line. To be able to follow them at this stage anyway, you could follow any one of those colors, the gold, the blue, green, purple, and trace it all the way down from the blowpipe to the tip of the piece. So we get this twisted up as much as he wants, and then he'll begin the uh, raking process, which is the feathery look. So you're going to have lines of colors over it maybe, oh, let's say about a 45 degree angle. And those lines will then be raked toward the top, which is uh, really a lot different in terms of the geometry of the bees than what we normally do. And you'll see him look up at it there. Ah, he's going into the optic mold because that thin mold actually will grab the sides of the glass and allow him to twist it even further. Let's get down here for a good look and you can see how much more extreme that twist is from going into the optic mold. That's really beautiful. There we go. So now we've got the twist from top to bottom there, and you could, like I say, trace, trace any one of those individual colors all the way down. You talk about students, how long does it take to learn these techniques? Uh, that varies. <laughs> Yeah. Three days, I guess. We've been here 21 years. Josh has been here 18 years. Foster's been here 100 years. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, um, for most students, the biggest techniques to learn are handling the glass, keeping it centered, and learning to blow it out and make a simple shape like a drinking glass, a bowl, or a vase. And we can usually... We can get through that usually in the space of a four-week class, but to develop proficiency at that would take a couple of years, and then beyond that, it takes even longer to get practiced at gathering the color and all this other stuff. So what Todd's going to do here now, he's put a glove on his right hand, and he has a tool with a hook on it, and now he's going to feather the glass. So he'll pull it back, and uh, he'll put the hook over toward the end of the piece, and then pull back on it. And he'll do uh, four pulls with that and then four pulls away. So he grabs the tip and he pulls way back toward the pipe until he gets all the way down. Now you notice the glass was in constant motion. Okay? So what he'll do with this time, what you'll see, is his target is hanging down, then he flips it up and he pulls back toward the pipe. He'll pull that all the way down, and then he'll reheat. So now we have two that have pulled all the way up. Now he's going to turn it 90 degrees. He's going to let his target area fall away from him. It'll fall toward the floor, 
Then he'll flip it up so it's pointed to the ceiling. And while it's flipped up, he's going to grab it and drag it right between the other two. And notice that while he does that, it's still falling toward the floor. So it's not like you can just focus on one thing and ignore the rest of it. Now he's got one more to do in this direction. Again, his target will fall away from him. He'll flip it upward, grab it, and pull it back, and down to the end. Beautiful. And now we have the four twists going up that way. Or four feathers, I'm sorry. The twists are going around. You'll also notice that the gather, or the parazon, got pulled way back toward the pipe. Because it's hot. And the hot glass moves and cold glass don't. Ha-ha! Correct, sir! You, did, you didn't think I'd work that in this you week, did you? Sir. Okay. So, yes. anyway, he's now marveled it and changed the shape of it again. So... Actually, for someone that's first starting even, stupid little sayings like that are really helpful because it, you don't have to remember. You can just think, oh my gosh, that's right, hot glass move. Now we're going to go toward the, the tougher one. The tougher one is when you pull away. Stupid little sayings, man. Okay. That's me. Okay. So he's, he's going to take the hooking tool and he's going to start up near the blowpipe and pull toward the tip. Now this one gets a little trickier, so lots of times we only go about halfway or three quarters of the way and grab the other side, because you can see how the glass is not only getting misshapen as far as falling toward the floor, it's also getting pulled off the pipe. David Hogan said he was waiting for that, the hot glass moves. Okay, oh, always happy to help. Now he's going to finish up those first two pulls that he did coming down the piece and bring them toward the tip. And another thing this does is it helps you spot where you've already been. <laughs> now, now you know where the other two go pretty easy. Been there, done that. It'd be like the old uh, high bob game, where every time you say hot glass moves, cold glass moves. Yeah, okay, up for that. All right, so he's going to get the heat back in and again, and he'll probably do the same pattern. He'll go about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way up on one side. Flip it since it was falling away. Drag it up a little further, and there we go. We're most of the way up pretty well to where he wants to be. Now another application of heat. He'll finish the job at the bench. You'll also notice when he does that at the bench, he lowers the pipe below the left hand rail. And that's so he can point the pipe upward a little bit. This keeps the pipe and the glass in a little bit straighter line as he does this manipulation. If he were doing this with the pipe level across both bench rails, it would fall toward the floor more dramatically. So what we kind of try to do right here is to get all four of those tips right together down in the bottom, and that gives us what we want. So there's your feathering technique. And away we go. Hot, oh, <laughs> I like this from Scott. Hot glass moves, but remember, cold glass can still burn you. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I don't want to scare the student. <laughs> You're not trying hard enough. You're not scared of him. Okay, so he's got the feathering done. He'll take care of uh, cleaning things up, shaping and whatnot. And then he's ready to go ahead and uh, get a little bit of air in it probably. And then he'll do his gather and he'll go through the white. Yes, Joanna, it, it is very interesting. Uh, and, and the color looks really good too. So, like we said before, the piece gets a little bit uh, distorted, and now he's also twisting the feathers, right? Yes. Okay, so he's turning in one direction. He's turning clockwise. Can anybody recall 
from our language class a couple weeks ago, the Scottish term for counterclockwise. Whoa, somebody online is going to remember. You know what, though? I learned a new term the other day, antipodia. And uh, we found a recipe, my wife found a recipe for, they call it antipodia, and they're not biscuits, but they're going to miss all the Aussies on them. But we looked it up, and because Australia was basically 180 degrees out from the UK, basically exactly on the other side of the world from the Greenwich Meridian, that's where that term comes from. David Hogan got it, Wittershins. Uh. <laughs> did you look that up, David, or did you remember it? That's better, you got it right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. When, uh, or... Or if when you first walk into this studio, you hear anti-clockwise. <laughs> okay. Oh, we got several other Wittershins in there now. Well, John, mine's not okay. as interesting as yours, but you know what they call ACDC in Australia? Wait a minute. Let's let's hear this for the crowd. <laughs> so what do they call ACDC in Australia? Because they're from Australia. A band? No, no. They, they don't call it ACDC. <laughs> We, we heard them. Any yep. ideas? No. I'm sure somebody on there would know. Uh, Tesla Bell? <laughs> Current? Akadaka. A what? Akadaka. Akadaka for yeah, alternating. Of the water buffaloes on the Flintstones. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Akadak. Akadak. Yeah. That's what they call ACDC. Aren't you guys wow. glad you tuned in today? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's when Jacob was listening to his uh, ACDC vinyl. Really? Yeah, cool. <laughs> I saw a really cool t shirt that used the. Uh, the typeset for the ACDC logo, but instead of ACDC, it said ADHD, and the <laughs> quote on the bottom of it was, highway to, hey, there goes a squirrel. <laughs> All right, so we've got the uh, twist. We've got everything twisted up here. Pull, and the twist again. And I don't know if that shows in the camera. That's not numbers. showing on the camera because of the shadows. Maybe, yeah, that's a little better. Okay, now you see not only the twisted color stripes, you can see where the feathers are twisted also, and they fold into those stripes. Beautiful. So now this one's all going to be covered with another layer of glass and a background white. And okay. Then, uh, we'll inflate it, put a foot on it, turn it around, spin it out. Okay. Oh, there it is. Just come over here and get it from the, with the sunlight from the across it. I can actually got a pretty good it? view here. Yeah. It's really nice from the back side, too. There's your color. Beautiful. This is going to be sweet. All right, so Todd will take another gather here in a moment. Then after he gets that ga glass gathered up, he's going to roll through the white. And then the white will be the canvas that sits behind the platter and all these colors will show up really vibrant. We think it's awesome too, Joanna. So remember to, uh, well, make sure that you comment. And some of you are doing a really good job of that because all of your comments get you entered in the drawing for the free piece. And next week's free piece is going to be a single long stem Celadon goblet. Here we go, just like the one Foster made today. And the winner of last week's piece was uh, Mary Beth Morgan. And we haven't seen her on here today, but hope you watch us on YouTube on a rebroadcast, Mary, and all's going well. Todd's gonna let some of that glass strip off. You can see the fluid nature of it. It just drizzles right off into the bucket. And yes, we will be uh, reusing that clear glass that's down in there. And while the glass is fresh and hot, he's gonna come over here and start picking up the white. It starts at the back end there on this taper, 
because he doesn't want the glass to elongate while it's so hot. Then he'll turn and cover the end of it. Cindy, we're all anxious to see the finished product. This is the uh, Gaffer Bet E plug. This is what? The Gaffer oh. Bet E. Okay. Bet E plug. Oh. <laughs> I can't match you for dad jokes. Where's the <laughs> sound machine? I need the sound machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, just got the way you're going again. I like how you just go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Huh. Oh, no, no, he goes, huh. Okay, <laughs> let's get back to that. <laughs> you guys have been around long enough. That's typically what happens when I don't hear what was said. Right. <laughs> You know you've screwed up when you have trouble hearing and somebody says something and they look at you expectantly like there's supposed to be a response. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now we got the ball covered in the white. Is that it? One more. Or as musicians would say, back to A. <laughs> All right, so one more application of white. And what you see right now is what will be the lower side or the back side of the platter. So whether it's displayed on a wall or whether it's displayed on a table, this will be underneath, and those beautiful colors will be exposed perfectly. So Judy Fox wants to know, Todd, what's it smell like in here? Creativity! <laughs> no, come on, guys. No, come on. Let's hold it together. Because I'm all ready to get started. I was just going to say before or after lunch. But what does it smell like? What does well, it actually, smell like in here? Actually... Like, like a wood, like a really, actually nice, like a wood-burning smell. We had a, we had a annealer components uh, burning in, and the adhesive sometimes that holds them together will uh, sort of simmer and burn off a little bit. That's always uh, right. This color here, uh, this white, is is lead free, and I don't believe it's made with arsenic. But when no, we first started, you can't get it anymore. But okay. it used to be that whenever you you rolled your glass through white powder or frit, there was this horrendous almond smell of the arsenic being expressed into the air. So, uh, no. fortunately, we're away from that. Yeah, for 100. That's a good one, David Hogan. I like that. It's a Nirvana reference. Oh, okay. David Hogan says Team Spirit. It smells like Team Spirit. <laughs> Here we are now. All right, so Todd now is uh, inflating it. You can see that he used the newspaper there a moment ago to cool the bottom so that the inflation doesn't blow out the bottom of the platter. And he's going to get this a good bit larger. He's got a pair of calipers there on the back of the bench, and that's going to be the size he's going for. So we know he's not quite there yet. So he's going to continue to heat. He'll blow it out, begin a jack line in it, for a point of separation and take some measurements and make sure he's got it where he wants. Axe body spray. That's a good one, Cindy. No, there's nobody in here wearing axe. We're all above, uh, well, almost all of us above 40. And there's no old spice either. Uh, maybe a little vitalis. Okay, by pointing the glass downward like that, it lengthens away from the pipe. He's having too much fun, folks. Ah, uh, big day. That was what Josh said. Ah, that was Josh's, huh? How long? Paper cools the bottom, he inflates it, 
You'll see that bubble grow in the upper regions, but the bottom doesn't expand a lot. And in just a little bit here, he'll be pretty close to what he wants for his final dimension. It smells like victory. Love the smell of glass in the morning. Tracy Kaup and Trovel says we're hilarious today. <laughs> Do you have to heat the building in the winter or does the escaping heat keep it warm enough? Well, yep, you got it. The, the escaping heat is what we have. <laughs> there are a couple of small space heaters around. Uh, there's a little bit of heat down there where Theta sits ensconced at the computer. But for the rest of the studio, it's whatever comes blasting out of the furnace or the glory holes. And actually, we actually have the fans going to cool it because yeah. it gets so hot. We get pretty hot in here. So, uh, now during the downtime, so we're not working, all the glory holes are off, and really the only source of heat in here is whatever would uh, come around the furnace. And you can see with all the cladding, the metal, and we've got layers and layers of uh, insulated brick in there, even though it is hot and would burn you to the touch, it doesn't generate all that much heat. We've had winters in here where the water in the block buckets froze. So it does get cold. Now by using the blow hose, Todd can inflate it. The paper holds it in place and the bottom doesn't expand, but you can see the middle of it, the central portion, the diameter is expanding quite a bit. Todd, did you have to turn on three? No, two in one. I put the I put the uh, shelf in. It's 18 from front to back. So okay. I think as long as we're good on the right-hand side, it goes in. So right now they're discussing how much room is in the uh, annealer to take this piece because without annealing, it'd be a lost cause. You can you might be able to see the smoke rising from the newspaper. You can see it in the uh, sunbeam there coming through the window. So uh, right now it smells like burnt newspaper. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, quoting Jerry Reed, when you're hot, you're hot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so Todd is going to, uh, Todd's going to get this to the final size and shape. And it, it's kind of a squat shape. Uh, he can actually use the newspaper to push in on it a little if he needs, but you'll notice that it's not elongated like the base that Josh made earlier. So, by holding that in place and then blowing against it, he controls where the inflation goes. When he gets up to the size he wants, Josh will gather glass for a foot and he'll drop a foot on the bottom. So he's measuring the width. First David McDermott, what you need? Yeah. Oh. Squeak, squeak. So there we go with the uh, smoking paper again. I'll step out of the way while they get ready to do this stuff. So Josh will take a gather or two, depending on how much he gets out of there, and he'll shape it up a little bit and cut a neckline in it. So they'll do it just exactly like Foster did with the foot he dropped on the goblet. Only smaller, only bigger. This was, small. okay. So Josh has got the block on it right now to give it a nice uniform round shape. He's gonna cut a little bit of a jack line in it and then walk it on over. Todd, in the meantime, is gonna flip this bowl up to vertical, point it straight up in the air. And then when Josh comes over, he'll deliver it. Todd rests the pipe on his foot, spots the bottom. Todd's focus is on the piece, bringing the two together and snips it off. A quick reheat and then very much like uh, no Cindy, the glass doesn't really, uh, the paper doesn't really leave a smudge on the glass. So he'll come back and either use the back of the jacks or a wooden paddle or maybe even a carbon paddle to shape that and straighten it out. If it's off a little bit, he just waits, files it in, and then he flattens it. And while we're doing this, 
Josh is preparing the putty. And he's saying, Bruce, get out of my way so I can make the putty. Okay. I heard that. We've got telepathy in here. Okay. So, Josh makes the putty. Todd, you look for the big one? The uh, Sofietta? Portico. You want to clean it up? I haven't cleaned it yet. Okay, so out of consideration for COVID and everything else, Todd is using the same piece of uh, same tool that Josh did earlier. So Foster's sanitizing it now. The beauty of this process is we can delay things as long as everybody keeps their glass warm. So Josh reheats the putty a little bit. Now Todd is going to use the Sofietta to cool the putty site. He'll use his tweezers to place the punty in the center, and then the tweezers on the pipe allow him to recenter it. And because this is so doggone hot at that joint, he's going to blow into it with the Sofietta. This cools the glass right there at the juncture. It's not cooling the rest of it. When Josh says, I'm not ready, Todd waits a minute. We don't want this piece falling off on him. So, a little bit of water, tap, and you can see it really kind of move quickly. So it was still hot, but we've got it under control. So just like every other piece we've made, that was cold enough to fracture. It's going to take a little while to reheat. You can see it wobbling around, and that's because of the heat and the punty still. So Todd will adjust it and turn as necessary and then occasionally eat the rest of it. The really neat part about a piece this wide is you can see it nearly blocks the opening. So there's not a lot of heat coming out around that vessel. The flash heats are to keep the rest of the body warm. So since the piece is blocking heat from coming out, the back side of this platter is not getting really, really hot. You'll probably have to flash a little more frequently. Oh yeah, Bridget, this, this is a big show today. Bridget said she uh, had to leave and take care of some stuff and uh, get her next COVID shot, but she was surprised to find us here. Oh, good for her. Yeah, so good thanks for, for coming head. back. Okay, so Josh has got one paddle shielding Todd's forearm, and the other paddle was to flatten the lip. No, that's not the... Uh, Cindy, if you're talking about the glory hole, no. That is not the widest opening we have. Uh, there's another set of doors there, and he'll have those open when he spins this out. But for right now, we like to keep it closed up some. It does a couple of things. It concentrates the heat. It also keeps us from losing heat out into the room. On pieces this large and things that require a lot of reheating, it's entirely possible for the glory hole to get too cold and not recover its heat with the doors all wide open. So this is the next to largest opening we have. Todd's going to continue to shape this and blow it out some, then he's going to gradually open it up to what looks more or less like a straight-sided cup. And then he'll take care of spinning it out with centrifugal force and ruffling it. So you can see the motion in it. It's starting to expand a little bit. There'll be a bright orange color in the top. Josh seals his arm first, and when he asks for it, he puts a paddle on. So we're getting toward that straight-sided vessel we talked about. He's using the metal jacks and getting that out there. The paper helps shape the body for roundness. Now he's setting up the wood jacks, or the partophies. They're larger blades, they also don't scar the glass, and they don't steal as much heat as the metal. So he's going to use those the next time around, and then you'll see that straight-sided vessel we talked about. Don't forget, we got gift certificates, we take custom orders, we'll do repairs, we got an online catalog. We are your full-service class studio. 
no reaction from these guys. Wow. Okay. Oh, and don't forget, we've added something new this week. We started doing a YouTube live presentation, sort of an appetizer before the main meal. And we do that at 1030, just so we can do a quick kind of down and dirty demonstration without all the joking around and the other nonsense. Hey, you're starting to get an idea of what the interior of this vessel is going to look like. You can see all those colors swirled around and the feathers twisted too. This is nice. Okay, so now I think it was Cindy. Yeah, it was Cindy that asked. We're getting close to the largest opening. You'll notice he opened the door on the right side. He's going to want the left doors open here in a minute. And he's got them open. Now the centrifugal force and the speed of his rotation is what's going to control that glass in there. Once he gets it centered, the faster he goes, the, the more symmetrical it becomes. Look at that pattern. Oh my God. And there we go. So he dips down with it and turns slowly, and that gives him the ruffles in it. You can see all those colors beautifully in there. And we will post online pictures when it comes out of the annealer. So now he's getting in position to take it off. chipping around. Now he's going to put a little bit of water right on the juncture and a tap to the blowpipe and off we go. Into the annealer. Awesome Todd. Absolutely awesome. Let's hear it for Todd. Yes it is absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you folks. Thank you Todd. Awesome job. I like the color pattern. That looks great. Yeah, yeah. Really it's looks good. Thank you. Okay, so that's all for today as far as uh, what we've got to demonstrate. So uh, remember, we've got a drawing for one of the uh, um, Celadon Blue Long Stem Goblets for next week. And uh, Mary Beth Morgan won the uh, Copper Ruby Jack in the Pulpit. Samples of the pieces we've made today, the long stem goblets, the uh, powder vase, the flower trumpet vase, and of course the platters, but the platter had an absolutely new design that we hadn't tried before. So join us next week here on uh, Facebook, and also if you got an extra 30 minutes to kill beforehand, tune into our YouTube channel, we'll be there, and hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.